Today on The Topping Show, Ben & Jerry's faces backlash after tweeting on the 4th of July that the United States should give Mount Rushmore back to the indigenous people. Bud Light analysts say there's no coming back. Indiana Jones continues to flop and is actually surpassed by a company who had 5% of their budget. Joe Rogan and Ice Cube both slam trans athletes in women's sports. Trump criticizes DeSantis' stand on ethanol. The Biden administration approves the first offshore wind farm. Canadian judge rules that a thumbs up can actually count as a signature on a contract. Twitter might sue Facebook. Bucky's brace ground on their first store in Mississippi. Bye Bye Baby reaches a tentative sale. McDonald's to start selling wedding catering services. And the Winklevoss twins to sue Digital Currency Group. All of that and much more on The Topping Show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see the founder at least twice a day. Gotta say, he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, that, that, that's the joke. If you're a business owner or an IT leader and you need a little assistance, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going on to the business part of the podcast, you have Twitter perhaps going to sue Facebook because of their recent Threads launch. Now, Threads is a censorship spyware app that Facebook developed to try to compete directly with Twitter, where it's a very similar format, where you just, I don't know if you call it, instead of tweeting, you call it threading, maybe threading the needle. Some of their marketing department may get a raise or fired, depending on how this goes. But it's one of those instances where Facebook decided to compete directly with Twitter. They had this old platform, it had about 30 to 45 million people sign up within the first 24 hours. And Elon, start, Elon Musk is starting to take notes. So Elon Musk actually tweeted, quote, competition is fine, cheating is not, unquote. Now, there's several allegations that Facebook was the reason that Twitter actually introduced limits for how many articles people could read. This is because as recently as a couple weeks ago, the team over at Twitter couldn't help but notice that there were mechanisms, probably automated systems, actually scanning all those, I was about to say thousands, millions of conversations and tweets taking all that data, scraping it off for reasons. And now we know the reason is so that they can develop their own tool. So we'll see if that's enough for there to be a legitimate lawsuit. There's also rumors that it actually appears to be a couple ex Twitter employees who went over to Facebook specifically to build this competitive app. And time shall tell to see if Facebook pushes back. They also both have billions of dollars and an army of lawyers. So this could be something that's just tied up in the courts for a decade or more. It's, it's one of those things where it could take quite some time to actually get to the bottom of this. And at which point, Facebook might already have surpassed Twitter number of users. Personally, I'm a little bit skeptical because since literally day one, Facebook threads was already censoring people, particularly people on the right. And yet another reason not to join it, it just they're also pushing prominent left people politically speaking you don't have a choice you're going to see what AOC has to say regardless of how many brain cells you might lose from reading it but it's one of those things where you don't get it's not showing you what you want to see it's showing what they want you to see yet another reason I did not take time to actually sign up for that spyware terrible application that wants to know is even more invasive than other apps which is saying something these days and time shall tell to see which company comes out victorious, both, both in this potential lawsuit and then mass market adaptation. Could, could threads actually chip away at Twitter's user base or surpass it? Time shall tell. Other interesting business news, you have Bucky's opening their first store in Mississippi. Now, this store is going to be 70,000 square feet. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is quite... <coughs> well which is quite larger than a typical convenience store. Those are between maybe three, 4,000 square feet. Uh, probably pretty much the opposite of a 7-Eleven this week. <clears throat> it's basically a whole Walmart or more. Time shall tell us how successful they are. Now, on average, Bucky's actually creates about 200 jobs and they're pretty darn good rates. This is as of 2019, it looks like their starting wage is about $16 an hour for a regular cashier, which is really good, especially when you consider that particular state wage is $7.25 per hour. And they know that team members actually make about $21 per hour. So it's a great economic as well as cultural thing for communities to get these great clean stores, great culture. Everyone, every time you go there, it's always 
really polite employees and great interaction. So I'm not surprised to see they're having more and more success and expanding exponentially. This one is currently on schedule to be opening in December of 2024. Other interesting business news, you have Bye Bye Baby tentatively, tentatively being sold. Now, Bye Bye Baby was actually started by the son of the founder of Bed Bath & Beyond all those years ago. And he grew the company and Bed Bath & Beyond eventually purchased the entire company and absorbed it into their family of other businesses that they also owned. And it looks like the current winning bid is coming from a company called Dream Omni Industries headquartered over in New Jersey. They specifically are going to buy the intellectual property of Bye Bye Baby. Now, unfortunately, the way that is written, that means that the current stores aren't being salvaged and those employees are most likely going to lose their jobs. You're not buying the infrastructure in terms of the physical assets of the store signage, the stores itself, the furniture, the employee base. They're buying the less tan the more intangible things. So specifically, this is in regards to the brand name, the sales data, the websites, as well as their mobile apps. And it's most likely the judge is going to approve this because the parent company, Bed Bath Beyond, recently filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which is usually for restructuring. They just did to stay open long enough to liquidate all their assets. And they recently sold all their intellectual property to Overstock.com, who pretty much immediately said that they were going to revamp their website. So Overstock.com, that website actually will no, no longer be their publicly facing site. It'll actually be Bed Bath & Beyond. And given the size or lack of their size of Dream Omni, I don't see any, any concerns like the SEC about you know monopoly or anything like that. And they're the highest bid for the, for the intellectual property. So most likely it's gonna be approved. And hopefully they'll be able to build out that brand, maybe hire back some of the former employees. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that intellectual property going forward. Other interesting business news, you have McDonald's starting to sell wedding catering packages, which, is brilliant, especially when you look at how much people spend on a wedding. It is an astonishingly, instead of putting a down payment down for a house, people will have a wedding, which is insane. I am all about celebrating the sacrament of marriage, but to spend 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars on a on one day on one day is one of those things where personally I much rather have more of an intimate more of an intimate occasion with maybe a a limited number of attendees and just do it at don't spend a car or a house worth of money on that one thing do it more economical but that's just my three cents it used to be two cents but hyperinflation is terrible i had to charge three it really should be charging four but i'm a generous man what can i say now the specific package coming from mcdonald's is going to be starting at 235 dollars that's it to cater a wedding now, the downside is I do not think that includes beverages or drinks. Hilariously enough, it should be, it'd be interesting to see if Coca-Cola does something like this since right now, or for actually for several decades, they've had an exclusivity contract where every time you go into McDonald's, it's going to have Coca-Cola. It will not have a Pepsi. And right now, the package that you buy, or rather the package consists of 100 chicken nugget sandwiches and 100 packets of four-piece chicken nuggets. Now, it should be known that this offering is currently only running in Indonesia. But I can't help but think this is almost like a business brilliance of the day. Just because it got my attention. It was so different. And it's a very simple idea. McDonald's has the infrastructure to make mass quantities of food. It's what they do all day long. Why not extend that to more occasion and catering services that might be a help, a good way to not only build the brand, I mean, brand is already very well known, but also increase your sales exponentially and kind of like business to business sales, it's very advantageous. It's much easier to sell one package of 100 hamburgers than sell 100, pe 100 people 100 hamburgers. It's a little bit easier to do that. That's why typically when you buy quantities, you get a discount because it's a little bit easier for that transaction. It'd be interesting to see if they bring this over to the United States I mean, if people are looking for a great ROI, I've heard worse ideas. Time shall tell, though. Now, going on to the culture part of the podcast, you have Ben & Jerry's feeling a blowback and their stock dropping. Now, Ben & Jerry's has been a ice cream company for my whole life, and not to, be, not to say I'm a trendsetter, but I've been boycotting them for 30-plus years. 
partially because I've never purchased a product, partially because I'm a man and I really don't need candy to be happy and I don't have kids, so why would I buy ice cream? It's like, I think, I'm trying to think of the last decade I had ice cream. It's a very luxurious, luxurious, frivolous item you do not need every day. Now, on the 4th of July, Ben and Jerry's thought it'd be a brilliant idea to tweet a message for everyone. So on the 4th of July, the most important date in history, July 4th, 1776, everything after that is just an afterthought. That's what started the revolution, the Declaration of Independence, the most important document in history. But I digress. So on this most special of days, Ben and Jerry's thought it'd be a brilliant idea to tweet that Mount Rushmore is on indigenous land and the United States should give it back. Which is a lazy BS argument that you hear every two weeks from people about indigenous land and companies and people should give it back. Since Cain and Abel, or since Cain and Abel first, you look at throughout history, going back to the very beginning of time, land has always been disputed and always been taken over by other, other cultures and other civilizations. It's how we're here today. No one has ever got, oh, I should say no one has ever gotten their land back a little bit in the United States, but more hilariously enough, Ben and Jerry's factories are also on land that used to be owned by indigenous people, because of course it, every land was. And a lot of people are saying, well, Ben and Jerry's, why don't you give your land back? You're a multi-billion dollar company. They're actually owned by a global company known as the Unilever, or Unilever, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And many people don't think it's a coincidence that Unilever's stock dropped precipitously by $2.6 billion on July 5th. Again, July 4th, the stock market was closed, so you really couldn't do much transactions and see much, but because of this backlash. And Unilever is also a hilarious company, partially because they own Dove Soap, which empower, pretends to empower women that are large and unhealthy. I say pretends because they own, they, they own Dove Soap, which has that message, but they also own Axe Body Spray. And Axe Body Spray, false advertising of the year, they claimed, oh, Axe, they also make deodorant. If you spray the, the body spray onto yourself, hundreds of thin, attractive women, well, double on top, I was going to say, attractive women, obviously, they would flood towards you. And I was, I was remiss to say, I actually was at a grocery store, or was it CVS, some type of convenience store. And there was a cute gal down the aisle. I saw the Axe Body Spray. I thought, all right, here's my moment to shine. I take it. Tss, tss, I sprayed it myself. I looked at her. She did not run. She didn't run towards me like a magnet. Quite the opposite. She was quite concerned and gave me a weird look. And to this day, I don't know if I'll ever forgive you, lover, for that false advertisement. Kidding, obviously, somewhat. But I digress. Now, in the same time that their stock dropped, their com competition actually did great. So Bluebell, a much superior company, also headquartered in the best country in the world, Texas. Yes, I said country. Not a slippage of verb or noun. Nevertheless, they've been owned by the same family for decades, still headquartered in Texas. And they got a lot of free publicity because they also happen to have a little carton of their ice cream that is red, white, and blue. It has the American flag on it, which is the best flag ever. So Ben and Jerry's not only managed to upset a lot of people, but they helped their competition. You're going to see this theme in a couple minutes where we also talk about other beer companies. Now, Unilever has also been named a international sponsor of war by the Ukraine, which I think that's a B. As much as I don't, as much as I'm not a fan of Unilever, I'm not going to call them like, I don't know, I don't believe in that. It's because Ukraine says, well, they still operate in Russia. Well, guess what? Russia still has Russian civilians who have nothing to do with the military conflicts. They have many people who are just living there, trying to live their life out. So, I don't blame Unilever for wanting to support those people. But that's just my three cents. With a stock dropping about $2.6 billion, it'll be interesting to see you know, how long, it, will it just jump right back up the next day? Well, I think the main concern is, is there gonna be a big boycott around this like the Bud Light fiasco, which has been the biggest boycott bar none in history. If you look at, especially food and beverages, there's never been a boycott to that magnitude where they lost $28 billion in stock valuation and also millions by millions about millions of dollars in sales. Usually there's, every week they're making about 27 to 30% less than they were the same week the previous year. So my theory is that the big reason you're seeing people concerned about Unilever, they're wondering, could this be the same thing? 
Now, I suspect Ben and Jerry's will not change any of their political stance or political affiliations or their messaging because they've done this for decades, so it's not exactly a new thing. I think more and more people culturally are starting to notice these businesses making these stances and they're not very appreciated of the two-faced hypocrisy, especially in this situation where their, their actual factory was on native land. And of course, they didn't, they're not going to offer that land back because they really don't believe what they're saying. They're just saying it for virtue signaling. Well, that's just my three cents. It used to be two cents for this four-year hyperinflation. I should charge four, but I'm a generous man. It's only, more, it's only three cents. Now, other interesting cultural news, you have Bud Light continuing to crash and burn. Now, even more analysts are starting to come out and say, there's no coming back. They're not going to recover these customers that they previously lost. Ever since the, hilarious, the date is hilarious. On April 1st, they actually hired Dale Mulvaney as their spokesperson. And that caused them again to lose $28 billion in value, millions upon millions of dollars in sales. Every week, again, they're losing, they're making about 20, they make lost about 27 to 30% of their sales compared to the same week the year before. And it's not one of those things where people are drinking less. The competitors are increasing their market share. Now, this has led to a fascinating cultural fa um, appreciation for Yangling. They've been around forever. They're the United States' oldest still operating brewery, still family owned too, which is an incredible testament and an awesome thing, in my opinion, is to have some, a business successfully passed down from generation to generation, providing countless jobs for the family and the community, and providing a great product for the end user. Now, that is the, the, the lack of politics that Yaling has done. They're, they're not participating in all these campaigns or messages or political messaging. And that's why I think a lot of people are attracted to that brand now, because they don't want to have an awkward conversation at work, or I guess most companies can't drink at, I guess when a picnic or a party or a bar, you just want to have a beer. You don't want to tell people, well, I still like a brand because of XYZ or I don't like brand because of XYZ. They just want to unplug and have a beer. Now getting down into the numbers of, you know, how much these brands are increasing or decreasing their market share. This is according to a beer tracker by the name of Bump Williams Consulting. And this is for the week ending June 24th. And all these percentages are compared to the sales rates of last year to this year. So it looks like Bud Light sales are down 28% compared to the same week last year. Now, more importantly, looking at their competition, you have Yaling sales rose 22%, which is huge for a business to have that much of a bump. And they're not spending any additional money on marketing. It's great for that family owned business. They're not having to do a $100 million marketing campaign. Bud Light and the parent company, Anheuser-Busch and Bev, they said they're going to spend three times as much as marketing this summer as last summer. I don't suspect it's going to work because people don't feel it's an authentic brand. They pissed off the left and the right and the, and confused the hell out of the center so that people don't want to have those awkward conversations. They're just not going to buy Bud Light. And because the competition is literally inches away at the grocery store, the products are right next to each other, you're going to see it's very easy for them to choose the competition. So if Yaling sales are up 22%, anecdotally speaking, at my store over in the great state of Texas, some call it a country as well. Now, in Texas, I looked at my local Walmart, you look at the beer section, and there was one section where there's just a hollowed out hole, nothing there. I looked at the little product SKUs, there was not, they were all yelling bottles and yelling cans of beer. There weren't any. However, on the opposite side of the equation, the whole shelf of Bud Light was untouched. Same with Budweiser, same with Michelob Ultra, and several other properties that Anheuser-Busch InBev owns. Granted, that's anecdotally just my one store over in Texas, but it's interesting to see all this anecdotal evidence have, add up, and here's a little bit more hard facts behind these numbers. So you have Yaling raising their sales 22% compared to the same week last year. You, just, you also have Coors. Their sales are up 19%. And anecdotally speaking, just walking down the aisle, I saw two people pick up beer. One was Coors, it looks like a little bit older gentleman, maybe in his 60s. And the other was, I think it was a middle-aged woman, and she actually picked up a pack of Miller. And compared to the same sales week last year, Miller is up 16%. Fascinating to see from a cultural perspective, more and more people are starting to realize the boycott is happening, and they're voting with their dollar. And 
It's one of those things where, kind of like a bad relationship, if you make a mistake and you just show up with a diamond ring or a diamond necklace, or if you show up with some tangible little knickknack or gift, but you don't say you're sorry or don't address the situation that brought you to that awkward moment, you're not really fixing anything. You're putting a band-aid on the situation. You're trying to buy someone's love, or in this case, in terms of Bud Light, you're trying to buy your customers back. I don't think a lot of people are going to appreciate that. And the CEO, Brian Whitworth, he's in a very awkward situation because if he does, well, he won't do this. He has to be basically a politician, which he's very good at in his three. But in terms of his action items, if he says, if he comes out and say, hiring Dylan Mulvaney was a huge mistake. We'll never do that again. We're going to get out of politics. If he does that, he will get the left extremely irate and they will boycott him exponentially. Granted, with the current demographic of sales, I don't know what the percentage is of that, those people who buy the products, but even with him acquiescing most responsibility and just, he won't even say they won't hire Dylan again, but because Anders Bush, Bud Light, they didn't stand up for Dylan in um, their own words, or rather critiques own words, you're having gay bars across the United States who are dropping Bud Light as well. There's a parent company or a business who owns, I believe, four bars within the Chicagoland area, and they were gay bars, and the owner said they dropped Bud Light because they did not stick with Dylan Mulvaney. Same thing with a couple bars in Minnesota as well. Those are, politically speaking, very left areas. You have Illinois and Minnesota, very much Democratic states, and this issue has become a political issue. So you're having people on all sides of the aisle dropping your products and boycotting you, and they think spending money on marketing is going to help. If I were a gambling man, I would say Outlook is not so good because, again, they're just almost like pretending the situation didn't happen. And the most that the CEO has ever said was, well, we just want to get back to making beer. Well, yeah, that, that should be your job the whole time. But because of your actions and lack of their actions, you've also not only lost $28 billion in stock valuation, millions by millions of dollars in sales, we also caused two bottling plants to close down. So there's two businesses whose job was, their main contract was with Bud Light. They had to lay off about like 600 employees because people aren't buying that swill Bud Light anymore. So they don't need the bottles for that brand. And hopefully all those employees are able to find gainful employment and perhaps a competitor's bottling plant. Because you do have Galing, you have Miller, you have Coors increasing their sales. And hopefully those plants will need more employees so that overall not a lot of jobs are lost. But again, the Bud Light business blunder of the century just continues to get worse. And I don't see them coming out of this tailspin. Let me know in the comments if you have any ideas or theories of how they might be able to do it. But as Magic 8, but 8 Ball might say, I mean, Outlook is not so good. Now, other interesting culture news, you have Indiana Jones 5 surpassed by a company who has 5% of their budget, which further shows the demise of what Disney used to be a juggernaut in the entertainment industry. They used to knock things out of the park, basically printing money for a living because the materials were such great quality and it was a universal product. People on the left, people on the right, didn't matter what your background was, everyone loved Disney. They loved, the original Toy Story was a masterpiece. Granted that was Pixar, which was later absorbed by Disney, but I digress. It's all the same company now for the most part. And their movies are just becoming, my favorite metaphor is a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. It's one of those things where every time you make a copy of a copy, the quality degrades. And it's the same thing for these movies. It's just copy paste. It's like a safety parachute in media production. They find something that works and they think, well, let's just we'll do it again and it'll make the same amount of money or maybe more. Which there's certain movies, I, I say it doesn't work usually, but I also have to admit that the Fast and Furious franchise is worth, every, I think they've made about $6.8 billion cumulatively with a couple of the single movies making a billion. So there are outliers, but then again, that's not a movie that you watch because of the way it challenges your intellect, but it's a fun movie. But those movies, I would also argue, work because there's no, not a lot of politics that I've noticed in them. They're a little, but it's not being shoved down your throat. Now, the particular film that's surpassing Indiana Jones 5, that one, and you have Indiana Jones failing because of a myriad of reasons. You have Harrison Ford being 80 years old. I recently did a poll on LinkedIn and asked people what was the top reason of Oh, why the movie isn't doing good. My three options and the other was just, you know, make a comment. But the first option was Harrison Ford's too old. Second, you have the feminist being injected into the film, which 
it was like putting a square in a round hole, peg, peg in the round hole, or peg in a square hole. That's the saying. But I am, the option was injecting the feminist lead into the cinematic universe there. And the third was that there's no continuity to be, between Indiana Jones 4. And 44% is said that it was because of the feminist lead actress that was put into the film. And it's one of those BS things where you have to qualify it, because it is true. To clarify, for the 50 millionth time, leads with females can do great. Resident Evil was one of the most successful sci-fi movies of all time. Same with Underworld with Kate Beckenstyle, or Stein, whatever, whatever her name is called. I'm not the best with pronunciations. Obviously, you've tuned in before, hopefully. But those movies, and then one of the most famous sci-fi movie is Aliens with Sigourney, Sigourney Weaver. Those movies are legendary, but they didn't feel like it was feminist um, verbiage shoved down your throat. Indiana Jones 5, she actually pejoratively says, well, that she she punches Indiana Jones and she's happy and proud of that fact. And she basically, the whole movie, he's treated like a doddering fool, a shell of a man with, he just should be guilty by default. No Indiana Jones fan wants to see that. I don't know who their target, target demographic is for this film, but certainly it's not for people who actually have seen the original ones. Now, I digress. That movie is failing epically. They spent about $300 million to produce it, estimated. And you have to add in about five hundred, six hundred million for the advertising. Yeah, they're going to lose money big time. Now, the film that's challenging it is by a name called *Sound of Freedom*. Now, that is a film in which the main actor has actually played Jesus before. He has some religious faith, which is perhaps why Hollywood is not covering it in masses. Ooh, masses moderately pun moderately intended. Now, it is an action thriller that thriller that follows the real life story of a the founder of an anti sex trafficking charity called Operation Underground Railroad, which, marketing, eh, brilliant term, but it's been used before. Maybe that's why he's using it. But it follows the real life story of Tim Bullard, which in terms of causes for a movie, that's a great cause and something that I think I wish more people would get behind in terms of, I think it'd be a political unification, a unifying political theme or an action people could take in terms of you know, sending resources to decimate, destroy that industry and protect the youth. My three cents. Now, he is actually used to be a special agent at Homeland Security, and he quit that to actually go on a journey to rescue the kids from the cartels and the human traffickers in Latin America. Now, when asked for comment of, you know, why did this actor take on the lead for the film, he actually quoted saying, quote, because God's children are not for sale. And he also Unquote. They also said that, quote, over 2 million children a year are being sucked into the deepest recesses of hell, unquote, when asked in reference to the industry. Now, this little movie with a much, much smaller budget is estimated that the movie's budget was about $14 million. And July 4th comes, which a lot of people celebrate by going to the, going to the movie theater. On July 4th, Indiana Jones that one day made $11,698,000 million. $11, Oh, I, I'm butchering this number. I apologize. Eleven million six hundred ninety-eight thousand nine hundred eighty-nine dollars. That's what Indiana Jones made in one day. The Sound of Freedom filled film made fourteen million two hundred forty-two thousand and sixty-three dollars. So within one day, that movie made back its budget. So that movie certainly has a good cause. It'll also make a profit, which in Hollywood seems to be a rare thing these days, as it's almost as if directors care, directors and writers care less about profits and more about virtue signaling and pushing politics. And it's interesting to see Hollywood is irate that this movie is succeeding. So the one or two articles that do admit that this movie exists, they actually take issue and say, you know, they say it's a political movie, which it shouldn't be divisive. It should be something that unites everyone. Although given Hollywood's past, I could see why they might not like this film. Now it looks like in terms of political involvement, Bollard, the real life one, he testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee and shared footage of the sting operations portrayed in The Sound of Freedom with the media. He was actually appointed to the Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council to end human trafficking by Donald Trump in 2019. So some people, I suppose, are saying he's a Trumper or he's a, he advocates for Trump. But Trump did nominate him to that position for that committee. Now, interestingly enough, the committee was terminated in 2020, which... Why would you get rid of that committee is beyond me. Seems like they were doing some good in the world, but maybe eh, I digress into uh, why that might be. They, they don't want that being, they don't want that to exist. But 
it's interesting to see all these articles just attacking the movie, saying it's a political movie, or say, criticizing this guy because the actor because he has religious, he's he has actually has faith in his life, or because the main person that the movie is about it looks like he was on this committee. Completely ridiculous, and it is nice to see some movies succeed that have a good messaging, and a lot of people are agreeing with it, and it has a good cause too. It's a win-win-win. Definitely some my three cents. Definitely should check it out in theaters. Now. Other interesting cultural news, you have Joe Rogan and Ice Cube slamming trans athletes in women's sports. And you're starting to see this big cultural shift where more and more celebrities are starting to open up to the idea of some of the thing, of wondering how is this not a massive advantage? Now, Ice Cube has always been a little bit, I would, I would argue a little bit more in the middle, politically speaking. He's been pro-gun for several years, as every American I would, I would say should, considering it's in you know, the Bill of Rights, which most important document in history, second only to the Second Commandments, or Ten Commandments. Fumbling my words today. Now, let's play a little clip of this and see what exactly are they talking about? Everything. Everybody, because of social media, everybody feels like they're fighting some sort of social battle with everything they do. And, yeah. you know, and this is one, this is another one. It's like, it's like forced compliance. You have to, you're forced to comply with this. And, you know, it's, very true. Up women's sports in a huge way, in a huge way. And, you know, there will be no women's sports if we go with the current trend. Some organizations are, are pushing back against that. And some people are pushing back against the organizations that are pushing back against it, which to me is insane. Like, if you care at all about biological women, you should be against that. Without it, I mean, what if, like, LeBron said he wanted to play in the WNBA? <laughs> like, I'm retiring from the NBA because I'm. 49, and I'm going to play in the WNBA. Well, With the current logic, he could. There's there's no reason they, he couldn't. Tomorrow he could identify as that. and he could, I mean, uh, most average people would crush it, as a youth might say, as a slang term for winning in the WNBA, but it would be highly entertaining to see him just what make well, a, get, two, be- get 200, 300 points a game able to stop it if he just decided to say publicly i identify as a woman what are they going to do they can't do anything and then that would be the end (laughs) that would be dave chappelle is a bit about it yeah (laughs) (laughs) brown scores 100 again tonight well there was some fucking knucklehead that was getting an interview they said if mike tyson identified as a woman should he be able to fight women and they were like well the short answer is yes Uh, mike tyson the greatest boxer in history Got more muscle density than like 10 men combined. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. It's okay. And there's also different specifications. It's like what you have to do and how long you have to take hormones before you can identify as a woman and compete as a woman. Like, just fucking stop. I mean, who's going to check all that? Yeah. There's a reason why there's women's sports. And yes. there's a reason why there's men's sports. And it's, we're, you're not talking about who, who you are and what your truth is. Live your truth. I mean, Title IX just got... You know, with just turn what thirty or yeah, something like that. You know what I mean? So protecting women's sports. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. which is which is great because it forces schools and you know they make a lot of money. You know, I mean, teaching whatever they teach in them schools, and they should. Uh, not much these days. I mean, we have history mass scores at all time low, perhaps by design. Interesting. Could carve out some for women to be able to play for their school you know that's great and um so i don't understand you know sometimes things don't make crazy man sense and when they when they don't make crazy man sense i just back out (laughs) 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 stop thinking about it yeah it's probably a good move because you're not going to solve it i mean if people i think ultimately it gets solved where people just don't accept it anymore and then hopefully it'll go. I mean, maybe they could just develop a transgender league where trans people play against yeah. trans people. That would be great. Why not? I mean, that's the only. If you want to actually have equal opportunity for everyone in, in these competitions, I would think that's the only logical way you could do it so that you don't have these massive inherited, quite literally inherited with their genes, advantages when you go to different teams. But you can't pretend you're a biological female just because you wish you were. Like, you can't pretend when it comes to women's sports. You can't pretend when it comes to women's rights issues. It's like, like that's not, this, 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 you don't want men dominating that. 
because that's what it is. It's men entering to women's spaces. Crushing world records for weightlifting and pretty much every sport. Yeah. And whether Which they have been doing. They identify as a woman, that's great. But you physically, you're a biological and, male. And, and, yeah, yeah. And you want to compete against them? You want to play rugby against women? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. That's crazy. No, they want to dominate. They want to dominate. There's a lot of that. They want to dominate. They want to be winners. Yeah. Yeah. If all of a sudden you can be a woman and a winner and just fucking kick everybody's ass. Yeah. You know how you used to, like, play the kids in basketball and, like, they ate? Yeah, mm -hmm. just shack out there. Yeah, <laughs> 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 you just shack. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> it's the ultimate sandbagging, you know? It's like... He's a comedian. He's missing that pun, or he's creating a pun and not acknowledging it. That's, come on. You know you have a giant advantage. Like the the one that drove me the craziest was the MMA fighter. That was insane. Because that person became a woman for two years and then started competing as women. That was the most. That's one of the most morally vacuous people I can think of. So you, this person had a lifetime advantage of having, being a man, having testosterone, building bone structure, decided to transition for two years and then compete in the MMA beat the crap out of these women and not telling anyone of that massive advantage. And I didn't see... I was surprised there weren't more major protests around that. Because the women they was going against, they didn't know. No one I'm did. telling them and saying it was a medical issue. It's, I don't have to disclose a medical condition. Like, that, no, 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 yeah. no. That's not what that, that is. Wow. Like if, you, if, they, if that person said that they were a woman and, and competed against women... That's deception. That's a fucking lie. But if you said you're a biological male and the women still want to fight you, okay. Yeah. All good. Transparency is key. Yeah, you know, um, it's tricky, man. It's like a slippery slope. Yeah. You know, they really stop. And that's a good summary because the slippery slope is no longer a theory. It's not really a theory anymore. It's been proven time and time and time again. It's we basically, for all intents and purposes, just call it the slippery slope fact. Because I, I really have yet to see it where it doesn't play out exactly like you think it's going to play out. And when it comes to women sports and athletes, we'll see if there's more pushback and see if anyone is brave enough to stand up for all the women who are losing their scholarships, their opportunities. Time shall tell to see what kind of cultural shift the United States, if the United States keeps going the current direction or... Maybe there's a cultural shift back. We'll see. I don't know what the Las Vegas odds are for that, but some might say it's a simple toss-up or a coin toss. I digress. Now, going on to the political part of the podcast, you have Donald Trump criticizing DeSantis' stand on ethanol. Now, recently Donald Trump criticized Florida Governor DeSantis and presidential nominee DeSantis for opposing a federal program supporting the ethanol industry. Now, that tactic could open up the former president's mixed record on biofuels with scrutiny. So it looks like Trump's gone back and forth on this. And this is very strategic in terms of geographically where Trump had this message come out politically when he spoke about it. Now, this was during his campaign in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And he told the state that, quote, you, quote, need to know, unquote, that DeSantis is someone who, quote, totally despises, quote, quote, ethanol. And has been fighting it, quote, for years. Now, I'm a proud Iowan. And a quick search on the internet will tell you one of their largest, quite, uh, not one of their largest, the largest crop in Iowa is corn. Now, it is somewhat a little hilarious and ridiculous. You can't eat the corn. It's all made for industry. So if you look at major usages of why farmers grow corn they can't eat, it's usually for cattle feed, so they can eat it. It is also for corn syrup, which is injected to every damn product on the planet. I would argue that's probably not good for you because yeah, probably not good for the obesity rates in the United States. And third big use for it is ethanol, which depending on your state is forced to put a certain percentage of ethanol into the gasoline when you go to this gas station. Usually most states will look at the little regulation placard and it says, you know, disclaimer, this isn't the good gasoline, you're getting neutered gasoline. It's about 10% ethanol in every gallon of gasoline you purchase which is done for a myriad of reasons. The logic back in the day was that the United States were going to try to become more energy independent, but instead of drilling for oil or natural resources in the United States, we we're going to grow it. 
interesting theory that in theory would decrease our dependencies on foreign countries, usually who don't like us, so we wouldn't need to buy their gasoline and fuel, we would have that 10% gap. This caused to have huge government subsidies for the farmers in states like Iowa, because they would grow the corn and be made with the specific purpose of being a fuel to put in your vehicle. Granted, never put pure ethanol into your vehicle unless it's designed for it, and even then it burns hot, so it wears down the vehicle more quickly, and it also is not as combustible as gasoline, because you, so you need more of it to actually get the same results. So, like Thomas Sewell says, there's no easy solutions. There's no magical free solutions, there's only trade-offs. I forget the particular, particular quote from him, but at the end of the day, there are no solutions, there's trade-offs. That's, that's the actual quote he says. And it's true, there are trade-offs with using ethanol, but it's also artificially decreased the price to the end user because the government pays massive subsidies to the farmers. So in terms of a political move on the chessboard, pretty good on Trump. In terms of the specifics of their actual agricultural numbers, and this was a couple years ago based on cash receipts in 2015, the top agriculture produce in Iowa was 8.8 .8 billion of corn, 7.5 billion of hogs. Uh, it looks like cattle and calves came in at 4.41 billion. So it makes sense. If you're campaigning in Iowa and a big part of their economy is corn and it's primarily sold because of ethanol, if you were to say you're getting rid of ethanol and gasoline, which would be better for your vehicles, you'd lose a lot of farmers votes and also the little ripple effect, all the people that the farmers interact with, all the, maybe the farmer buys certain clothing material or maybe they buy some feed from their neighbors or someone else. If they find out their neighbor voted for someone who got rid of their main livelihood and the farmer would have to change their crop or rotate the crop or they would have to change their entire farming business, business strategy towards alternative solutions that might be that would be more profitable because the subsidies are not there. So in terms of political move on chessboard, brilliant move by Trump because he needs to win a lot of the swing states. Historically speaking, Iowa's been pretty purple. Obviously it's skewed because you have the college campuses like Iowa City and the whole city is, a lot of the economy of the city is dependent on the public universities. But one of those things where it's actually a pretty good move on chessboard for Trump to bring that up and it'll probably get him a couple more votes over in Iowa. Now, other interesting political news, you have the Biden campaign, or rather administration, approving the largest offshore wind farm. Now, specifically, quote, the federal government has approved the largest U.S. offshore wind energy project, which officials say could power hundreds of thousands of New Jersey homes with clean energy and is expected, expected to create over 3,000 jobs through construction and development. I use extra quotes for that, political, that particular statement because look, in terms of construction development, those are more short-term jobs and the construction companies already exist. So this is just, eh, I don't know how many additional workers you have to hire. It is true is somewhat creating more economic opportunity for them perhaps. Now the Interior Department Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which usually I, I appreciate good marketing and you know acronyms, but that one just sounds so awkward and convoluted. And then the acronym is BOEM. And I know it's public sector, it's the government, they're, they're, not, they're not the best at marketing. But yeah, that's marketing fail. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM. Yeah, no one's putting that on the resume probably. Now, they announced its approval as of, uh, of Ocean Wind One Project's farm for construction and operation Wednesday. It is New Jersey's first offshore energy project and we located about 13 nautical miles from southeast of the Atlantic City. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy said that the announcement marks a quote unquote pivotal inflection point unquote in the state's transition to carbon free power. Now the development is actually by a Denmark based company by the name of Orsted and they claim that the project will generate enough energy to power up to 500,000 homes with nearly 100 wind turbines off the coast of southern New Jersey. So a little bit of a discrepancy of how many homes they think are actually going to be powered by all, by all that. But the issue with a lot of these wind blades is usually the cost of operations, the long-term ROI, and the materials also have to be a little bit hazardous. You're not supposed to let them you know, just drop to the ground and decompose or not decompose in some cases. And they're also going to be in the ocean. So it'll be interesting to see, I'd love to see once it gets constructed, the real-time data of how much energy they're producing, how much does it cost to maintain these types of apparatuses. 
Again, it's interesting to support new technology. I know other countries are implementing these types. But not, I don't know, in terms of my three cents, the best, right now, the greenest energy we have, and I mean real green, as well as green fiscally, would be nuclear power. Which some might argue is actually 100% renewable because the byproducts are a new product in and of itself. Depleted uranium you can actually reuse for industry. So, interesting little fun fact of the day. Now, other interesting political news, you have a Canadian judge ruling that a thumbs up is now admissible and now counts as a signature on a contract. So be careful how you use your emojis. I always say a true man does not need emojis to, to communicate himself. Great for children. Now, a Canadian judge ruled on that recently, and the case that is specifically ruled upon actually involved a grain buyer sending out a mass email text to a bunch of clients and a farmer agreeing to sell 86 tons of flax for about $13 per bushel. It looks like the farmer texted a, contra a contract agreement to the, f the buyer texted a contract agreement to the farmer and asked for the farmer to confirm receiving the contract. He issued a thumbs up emoji as a receipt of the document, but backed out after the deal of, of the deal after flax prices actually ended up increasing. So, so those instances where it looked like it was, and again, it sounds like a cliche to say, but a miscommunication, but this farmer by the name of Chris Atcher kind of made perhaps the discount of uh, Archer. So instead of a spy, he's a farmer. I don't know if that's a pun, but it's a moderately interesting observation nevertheless. Now, Chris Atcher said in an affidavit that he, quote, did not have time to review, unquote, the contract and the thumbs up with it was just an acknowledgement of the receipt. As in, that was just him saying, yes, I received this information. Now, I'd be pretty interested to see if someone actually did the... I would be astonished to send someone a whole contract in text. That sounds cruel and unusual. I know people usually have smartphones the size of a dinner plate these days because it gets so much bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. But I can't imagine reviewing a whole legal document on a cell phone like that via text. To me, that'd be a little bit awkward. I know the youth are different these days. The technologies, they might appreciate it. They might have really good eyesight or maybe they have the Apple nerd goggles that just slap it on their head so they can re read it like they're in a movie theater. But I digress. It's fascinating to see and politically speaking, if you're doing business with Canadians or you're moving to, or you're, I was going to say, heaven forbid you move to Canada, but if you're in Canada, this is fascinating to see. It used to be a cliche where you talk about the United, in the United States, there's been many instances where a conversation in a bar and two men writing down a contract on a, a cocktail napkin and signature that's kind of been the old staple of legal debate in terms of contracts. And you also have alcohol involved at that point. And it's interesting to see we've gone from talking about, you know, cocktail napkin contracts to literally emojis now being a part of the legal system and counting as a signature. And I can't help but think that's pretty ridiculous because a signature, in my opinion, and I know you have doc technologies like DocuSign where instead of actually writing out your whole signature, you just click a button and it'll just copy paste a nice cursive signature. But to me, there's a big cognitive difference between me taking time to write out my signature on a contract as opposed to just texting someone a thumbs up. The amount of effort needed for a thumbs up is so little it can be, done, in my opinion, done accidentally. It's not, it's one of those things you do without, without even thinking. Signature, and again, we're not talking about a lot of brain power, but it makes you think a little bit more. So I'm surprised to see, well, I guess I shouldn't be surprised based on the legal, the legal presidents of Canada, but is it, eh, it's still interesting to see a thumbs up is now as good as a signature in a, on a, for a contract in Canada. And of course, what I always tell people when it comes to political trends and even cultural trends, you see a lot of drip down from Canada. Usually a lot, many laws actually start in Canada and then, in fact, I mean, go down to California and then they go to other states. So it's fascinating to see the political movements when it comes to spe many specific laws and initiatives. And it's been they've it's done this same little trickle effect with many other different presidents and different laws. This might become the United States sooner than we think. Yet another reason to not use emojis. But if you do, be careful, especially if you have the thumbs up emojis. Now. Going on to the business blunder of the day, we have the Digital Currency Group sued by the Winklevoss twins. Now, it looks like the billionaire twins, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, are suing the SoftBank banked, SoftBank backed, geez, bad marketing to have that, 
But nevertheless, the SoftBank-backed crypto company Digital Currency Group and its CEO, Barry Silbert, because they're alleging that that bank was actually accusing them of fraud as well as tricking investors. Now, this is because that bank was using a crypto broker by the name of Genesis, and that company was actually put into bankruptcy because of the implosion of FTX. So a very nice, more, much more complex than usual situation where you have many different businesses involved and many unknowns and many parties that, again, when it comes, the more parties involved, the more, dil, new, more due diligence you need to do, but also you have to be more skeptical because there's more variables in the equation and more, way, more ways than not the equation can fall or break and bad things can happen. And in this case, you have FTX just imploding exponentially Time shall tell us everyone's really held responsible for that. Sam Brinkman Fried was brilliant enough to actually make very generous political donations to both sides of the political aisle. And so we'll see if he's, he might go, I, I know he's been convicted of a couple things, but they've let more and more things slide with him. I wonder how much of his, how much of his life will really be spent in jail. But I digress. The, one of those interesting things where the business blunder at the end of the day, I would debate is doing business with the Wink of Voss twins. Their claim to fame is suing people. That's how they made a lot of money. They are also, I, I think they, I don't know if they won, but they were Olympic athletes. They're most famous for suing Mark Zuckerberg and alleging that he stole their idea for the Facebook or the social network, whatever you want to call it. And you decide to get in bed with and do business with them when you know that's one of their biggest mechanisms for making money. And you have this issue where you had these companies going bankrupt. So... Perhaps it's a double business blunder of the day. They were trusting FDX, and then they decided to do business with the Winklevoss twins. Nevertheless, those are both business blunders of the day. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to tune in today. We're trying to get to 3,000 subscribers this month, so I really appreciate you taking the time to click that subscribe button. Don't forget to like as well as leave comments. The feedback is greatly appreciated. Also, don't forget to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers. Heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe and fight the good fight.